Now we've created a database, and before we actually put tables in it and start to talk about how to actually work with data in SQL and how it's storing it, let's take a look at how we can set options. Now there are a number of options that you can set on every database, and some of these are things that database administrators can argue about, and some are very, very important and you need to understand. So let's go take a look at these. You'll notice that on every individual database that I have, I can right-click on this database. And when I right click, I have a uh, couple of options here. And the one I want to talk about at this time is properties. So if I go to properties down here, I can look at the properties for this database. Now, real quickly, I want to run through this, this list and I want to concentrate on options. General gives me information about my uh, database, the size, the space available. This is the free space in the database, number of users connected, and so forth. Files, this has to do with the files of the database. Notice my data file locations, the name of those files uh, out there uh, on the disks. File groups we haven't talked about yet. Options, this is what we're going to look at here. Permissions in the database. Extended properties on the database. This is very similar to extended properties on users that I talked about in another portion of the video. Mirroring, if you're using database mirroring, uh, they have uh, functionalities built in and transaction log shipping, which you will look at later. So kind of hang on to all of these. You will need these from time to time. Let's concentrate on options right now. There are a couple of settings here that you need to be aware of. Uh, probably the largest one or the biggest one is the recovery model, and it's right here. It's the second thing you see on the screen. This has to do with how transaction logs are treated, and we will revisit this when we talk about transaction logs later, but I want you to see this. The recovery model tells SQL Server exactly how to treat that transaction log. By default, it is on the full model, which means all transactions are recorded in the transaction log, and they stay there until we back the transaction log up and truncate it. So we always can basically replay all actions to our transaction log. Now, bulk logged. What if I'm going to import, say, 400,000 rows of data into my database. I can set it on bulk log, and this will prevent the transaction log from recording all those inserts. It simply puts one statement in the transaction log that a bulk insert was completed. Now, we'll talk about the implications of that later. Simple means that the transaction log is constantly being cleaned out, and we can't depend on it. So this is huge for now. Set this on full. We'll talk about it more later when we talk about transaction logs. Now, there are a number of automatic functions that SQL will do for you, and there's a lot of people who will argue and fight about whether these are good or not. Auto-close, for example, is set to false. What this does is by setting it to false, it means that when the last person disconnects to SQL Server, we don't necessarily close the database. It stays open all the time, and this is the way you usually want it because that avoids the overhead of having to open and close and open and close the database. Statistics, every time you run a query, a SQL Server, the query optimizer, looks at the tables and the column data and determines what's the best way to pull this. By creating statistics, by setting this to true on auto-create statistics, we're telling SQL Server, keep an eye on our data and constantly recreate these statistics so we always get the best possible query performance. Uh, auto shrink, uh, do we want to auto shrink the database and it drops below a certain size? Auto update statistics, and we can do those asynchronously. You can look in documentation for those a little bit later on, on your own. Look at the miscellaneous. There's a couple of things you need to know here. ANSI null defaults. This used to be real interesting on how you change this. You can only change it through Transact SQL. Microsoft has now exposed these in these properties. It's actually pretty cool. This has to do with how nulls are treated by the database. And again, I would direct you out to documentation to look at this. And it's going to determine how nulls get treated in calculations, how they get treated in searches, and so forth. And notice I can set the ANSI null to true or false. You'll notice it's false by default. I can enable or disable ANSI nulls. I can set padding, warnings, and so forth, and these are all uh, various settings that I now just simply have true false access to, much, much easier than it was before. Down at the very bottom under state, notice I have a, a true false for setting my database to be read-only or not. This overrides all other permissions, and this will turn my entire database into a read-only database if I set it to true. And restrict access, we'll talk about this in recovery, but you need to see that it's here. Right now, the access, multiple people can access the database. 
I can restrict this to a single person or I can restrict it, notice to restrict it, and this means only people with administrative permissions or sysadmins can access the database. You'll use this when you're trying to restore or work on a damaged database, but for now we'll leave it as multiple. So those are some of the options that you can set in the database, and again, remember the way you got to those was is you right clicked on the database, went to properties, and choose options and it takes you right where you need to go to set those various database options.